I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. The economy is in terrible, terrible shape. Pessimists say the economy could not possibly get any worse. Optimists say it absolutely can. Wholesale prices are up a whopping 10.8% over the past year. Gas prices have hit their 18th consecutive day of all-time highs. And the Atlanta Fed's GDP Now estimate is currently showing 0% economic growth, meaning that the U.S. is very likely headed for a recession. In order to combat the insane levels of inflation, the Federal Reserve announced yesterday that it will be raising interest rates by 75 basis points, which is the most aggressive rate hike since 1994. And Fed Chairman Jerome Powell has suggested he may raise rates by the same aggressive magnitude again in the near future. Now, we know that the hike will make it much, much more expensive to borrow money, but we don't know if it will succeed at getting inflation under control. Again, we've been expecting progress and we didn't get that. We got, we got sort of the opposite. So I also think the situation really since the, you know, the consequences of the Ukraine war become more and more uh, clear, what you're seeing is the situation getting, getting more difficult. And you look around the world. I mean, lots of countries are, lots of countries are looking at inflation of 10%. And it's largely due to commodities prices, but uh, all over the world, you are seeing um, these effects, and so the, and we're seeing them here. Gas prices, you know, all-time highs and things like that. That's not be, that's not something we can do something about. I love the way he begins. We've been expecting progress, and we didn't get that. We got sort of the opposite. Gee, do you think it does? It, apparently, we did get the opposite. But I do, I do love the line actually because Powell is clearly throwing shade at Biden. He's saying inflation is coming from the lockdowns and the war in Ukraine and the energy prices, the things that we here at the Fed can't do anything about. He's saying that the crappy economy is not being caused primarily by monetary policy. It's being caused by fiscal policy. It's being caused by Joe Biden and the rest of the geniuses who are driving the Western world off an economic cliff. We don't need Jerome Powell to tell us that. Our rulers screwed up everything, and most Americans know it. The guy who promised to build back better broke the economy. The Treasury Secretary, who promised us only transitory inflation, gave us record high prices on pretty much everything. And the quadruple vaxxed pontiff of public health himself, Dr. Anthony Fauci, has just come down with COVID. If I were a gambler, and we all may soon need to become gamblers to have a shot at paying our bills. If I were a gambler, I would stake my entire bet on precisely the opposite of whatever our genius rulers predict. I'm Michael Knowles, this is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment yesterday is from James L. Kerrig, who says, I guarantee that the same people who argued with a straight face in front of the highest court in New York that an elephant should be recognized as a legal person also believe that it's morally acceptable to murder a child in the womb up to or possibly beyond the point of birth. That's true. That usually happens. The, the place you see it is usually with vegetarian or veganism. There are some pro-life vegans but generally speaking, I'm just speaking anecdotally here, but the plural of anecdote is data. The vast majority of vegans I know are extremely in support of abortion rights. That seems crazy. You care about the little delta smelt, but you don't care about the human babies. But it actually does kind of make sense. It's just that people who take an extremely exalted view of animals and of the rest of the created world very often do not have a particularly exalted view of human beings. They kind of think that we're just, human beings are just like any other created thing, like the elephants or like the monkeys or like the tumblers or like wood or plankton or whatever. And so they, they don't take a particularly special view. Very often, it's pretty anti-human. But humans, we can do things. We do have a special place in the universe. We can fix our own cars. That's why you got to check out rockauto.com. Right now, go to rockauto.com, enter Knowles in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you. A buddy of mine wrote in to me the other day. He says, Michael, I made a truly terrible error. 
I went to the brick and mortar auto parts store. I knew, he knew what I was going to say. He goes there and this shop tried to charge him $400 for a part. He said, that doesn't seem right. What does he do? He opens up rockauto.com. He goes to their super easy to navigate website, takes him two seconds on his phone. He sees they've got the same part for 150 bucks. The guy all, he came this close to overpaying by 250 bucks, but what's he do? He goes to rockauto.com. He gets it. You don't need to be a pro. You can be a do-it-yourselfer. You don't need to go on some special time of day. Rockauto.com has every part that you need for your car or truck. It's got reliably low prices all the time. This is a family business serving auto parts customers online for 20 years. Don't be a fool. Do not waste money and throw it out the window. Go to rockauto.com. Get the brakes, shocks, carpet, wipers, headlights, mirrors, mufflers, lug nuts, or any other part you need. Make sure you write Knowles in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you. Before we get into just how our society is crumbling, I, I have to get to this. We've, we've wondered, where is he? Where is the most powerful politician in America? The man who dictated pretty much every aspect of our national life for two years, Dr. Fauci! Is COVID. I wish him well. I hope he's fine. It seems like he's doing okay. They issued a press release yesterday from the NIH. Anthony S. Fauci, medical doctor, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, part of the National Institutes of Health, and chief medical advisor to President Biden. Good grief. I got to pause right there. This guy sounds like he's the Queen of England. Qu Elizabeth II, Empress of the Realm, Queen of India. Lord, this guy, of course, he does because he considers himself the most important person in the world. So he's got all these titles. Fauci tested positive for COVID-19 on a rapid antigen test. He is fully vaccinated and has been boosted twice. He is currently experiencing mild symptoms. Dr. Fauci will isolate and continue to work from his home. He's not recently been in contact with Biden. And then they say, okay, that's it. Why, why do these guys, when they admit that they got COVID, why do they always have to say that they've been fully vaccinated and boosted twice. Doesn't that seem like it's undercutting their argument and their credibility? Dr. Fauci himself told us, if you take the vaccine, you will not catch COVID. And then they moved the goalposts and they said, no, it's not really about preventing catching COVID. It's just, it's about mitigating the symptoms. But what it, they initially told us was the vaccine, we're telling you 100% safe, 100% effective. It will stop you from catching COVID. So this guy gets four shots and it doesn't stop him from catching COVID, of course. And he doesn't, he doesn't apologize for it. He doesn't admit, huh, maybe I was wrong about this and virtually every other aspect of the epidemic. He says, no, yeah, Fauci got COVID, big deal, so what? He'll be back. Oh, he'll be, you thought you, you thought you got rid of me, you sheep? No way, I'll be back stronger than ever. I'm taking my energy from the coronavirus, that's right. I'll get 17 more shots and then I'll run your lives even more. Fauci is just the prime example of our ruling class. Incompetent, huge record of failure, and in the face of that failure, refuses ever to change his mind. Everything this guy says gets proven wrong, doesn't matter, he's, that's his story, and he's sticking to it. It's not just Fauci. He's particularly public, but it's all the rest of them too. And everybody knows it. There's a poll just came out from Politico Morning Consult. This is not exactly a right-wing publication. Politico leans left. The question is, is America on the right track or the wrong track under Biden? Almost three quarters of Americans say America is on the wrong track. 74% say that Biden's America is going in the wrong direction compared to just 26% who say America is on the right track. To put that in perspective, uh, just one month after Joe Biden was inaugurated, Last year, they, they did a similar poll. 47% said that the nation was headed in the right direction. So the numbers are way, way down, 47 to 26. Only 53% said America was headed in the wrong direction. Now that's obviously up uh, a lot more. So what is Biden going to do? What is this whole ruling class going to do? They've got to blame others. They can never look at themselves. They can never say, huh, I predicted a bunch of things and they didn't come true. I promised a bunch of things and I didn't deliver on those promises. I said America was going to turn around in the right way and every, actually everything's gotten worse. Remember when Trump was president? Do you remember when Trump was president and pretty much every single thing in the country and around the world was better? I can't really think of a counterexample. 
The, the only counterexample would be COVID because the lockdowns were worse then. And maybe Trump bears some responsibility for letting Fauci run roughshod over him. But don't forget those, those lockdowns and the COVID madness, that all of that was being pushed by the Democrats. And Trump wasn't able to outfox them and stop it. But that was still being pushed by, by the Dems. And then they, they've tried to continue those policies. And in some cases, they've been stymied in that by the courts and, and other institutions and just time and public opinion. But other than that, in, in what measure, according to what measure, was anything worse under Trump than under Biden? It's all worse under Biden. People know that. And so all Biden can do is blame other people. Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, she just said, look, I know the inflation's really, really bad. And one of the biggest drivers of inflation is energy costs. And yeah, it's true. We shut down the oil pipelines. And yes, it's true. We shut down the new oil and gas leases. But you know, we got a solution. Hey, oil companies, stop, stop charging so much. We are, we are calling on them to do the right thing, to be patriots here, uh, and not to use the war uh, as an excuse or as a, as a reason uh, to, not put, to not put out a production, not, to not do the capacity that is needed out there uh, so, that the prices can, so that the prices can come down. Hold on. So hold on a second. You're saying that the high gas prices, that's the fault of the gas and oil companies. I could see how you might be fooled by this if you didn't know anything about economics or how companies work. But what is Corrine Jean-Pierre actually saying? She's saying that right now there's this war in Ukraine that was largely caused by Biden's stupid policies with regard to Russia. And so you got this war and that's driving up energy costs. And uh, she doesn't mention that there are other reasons energy costs are going up, namely that Biden's effectively shut down new American oil production. And uh, so anyway, the oil companies, these awful American oil companies, they're taking advantage by driving the prices up. There, and what? So there's no pressure for prices to come down? Well, if that were the case, why don't the oil companies just always keep the prices up? Why don't they just steadily go up forever and ever and ever? The reason is there's competition between the oil companies and the oil companies will try to undercut one another. You know, you're driving down the street, you see two gas stations. They almost always have the same price. Maybe, and if one lowers the price a little bit, what happens? The other one lowers the price a little bit too. And if there's one down the street that's even lower, then the, the two companies right here, they're going to have to lower their prices because there's competition. And whoever's offering the lowest prices, that's, that's the company that's going to get people's business. So she's saying, no, look, you can't, you've got, you all need to bring the prices down and stop being so greedy. Corporate greed is the big problem here. As opposed to what? As opposed to the usual policy of corporate altruism? Of course that isn't what changed. The oil companies are competing with one another. They're trying to undercut one another. They're trying to maximize their profits. And one of the ways to maximize their profits is to undercut the other guys on prices, to be competitive in the marketplace. None of that has changed. That was true before the war in Ukraine. That was true during the war in Ukraine. It's, it's just as true today. The thing that has changed is the energy policy of the United States and the foreign policy that's driving it all up. But the, the Biden administration can't address any of that, or at least they don't want to. And so they say, no, it's you. No, it's you. No, it's you. The buck stops with everybody but me. When you want to protect your retirement, what are you going to do? You've got to go check out Alto IRA. Right now, go to altoira.com slash Michael. Insider intelligence estimates that by the end of 2022, the number of U.S. adults who own at least one cryptocurrency will climb 19% to 33.7 million people. Some surveys show that as many as 85% of millennial millionaires own crypto. How about you? Do you own any? If you don't and you're not sure where to start, you should check out Alto IRA. Alto offers alternative investment opportunities such as private companies, crypto funds, real estate, venture capital, and more. Alto IRA in particular is a great way to start investing and trading in crypto with a tax advantage retirement account. No commissions, no paperwork, no setup charges. Alto makes investing in crypto so incredibly easy, even I can do it. Just create your account, transfer the funds, start investing. Done. They're integrated with Coinbase. You get secure trading 24-7, 150 plus available coins on their interface, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, multiple ways to fund your account. It makes it super duper easy. Go to Alto Crypto IRA. Right now, you can start your account with as little as $10. AltoIRA.com slash Michael. A-L-T-O-I-R-A.com slash Michael. Start investing in cryptocurrency today. That is AltoIRA.com slash Michael. Corrine Jean-Pierre, 
the White House has no answer on energy, and because that's the, the big driver of inflation, they've got no answer on inflation. They don't even have an answer on the baby formula shortage. Remember that? Remember a couple of weeks ago, you got for a little bit a handful of headlines pointing to this crisis in the United States. Mothers can't get formula for their babies. So a reporter asks the White House about that. Here's the White House's answer. So I have two questions on baby formula. So first, um, what is the White House, what is the latest update the White House has received on the current infant formula situation across the country? Yeah, let me see if I have anything new for you on that. Uh, I think it's been a couple of days since we have asked, been asked that question. Okay. I don't have anything new. I know we made some announcements last week. Uh, I, don't, I just don't have them in front of me. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are, something tells me Corrine Jean-Pierre, the White House broadly, they weren't great in school. Well, we, we know Joe Biden wasn't great in school. He lied about his academic record in 1988 and he graduated toward the bottom of his class. But I don't think any of these guys were good in school specifically because of how they're trying to stall when they don't know the answer. You know, the teacher says, Hey, Johnny, what happened in chapter four of War and Peace? Says, um, chapter four? Yeah, chapter four. Okay, you want me to answer what's in, and you're talking, uh, War and Peace? And you start, and you're, you're stalling. And then the idea of stalling for time is you can make something up. You can have some kind of answer. What happens here with Corinne Jean-Pierre? They say, hey, um, I've got a really basic question about an urgent problem for lots and lots of Americans of all social classes around the country. Oh, yeah, uh, Okay, um, hold on. Um, let me, baby, uh, okay, the baby formula, yeah, just one. Hold on, let me just get to what, oh yeah, I have nothing. I have nothing. I have no answer. I've given this not even a moment's thought because what the White House, it, what's running through the White House's mind right now on this issue is, oh, you guys are still on about that? Oh, you, you annoying little mothers, you're still whining about how you can't feed your babies? Why? I want to talk about really important things, like electric cars. Oh, you all are still, oh, this is so annoying. I want to talk about stuff that really matters, like transgendering the children, like Pride Month. I want to talk about the really important, not feeding, not feeding your children. No, no, no. We want to trans your children. If you want to talk about child issues, that's something. We, we need to talk about why we need to let men swim on the women's swim team. Their priorities are just so out of whack here. The baby formula shortage is affecting huge portions of America. It cuts across virtually every demographic. Transgenderism is an important issue to like seven people. And what does the White House focus on? It's all these other issues. They're annoyed. Hey, could you, could you guys fix inflation? Stop bothering me about inflation. That doesn't matter. I want to deal with climate change. And people are noticing, and it's not just right-wing Republicans, and it's not, not just conservatives. It's people from across the political spectrum. Speaking of babies, it's a really important story, and it's getting no attention at all, of course. There are 23 pro-life organizations that have been attacked, firebombed, vandalized in recent weeks. Catholic Vote put together a list. Breitbart's reporting on it, too. The South Broward Pregnancy Center in Hollywood, Florida, the Archdiocese of Miami Respect Life Ministry in Asheville, North Carolina, the Mountain Area Pregnancy Services, Manassas, Virginia, First Care Women's Health, Alexandria, Virginia, Concerned Women for America, Risertown, Maryland, Alpha Pregnancy Center, the list goes on and on and on. Maryland, New York, Wisconsin, Texas, California, Oregon, Washington, all over the place. All over the place, we have attacks on the pro-life centers. You have, if you've heard a word about it, you've heard it on this show or on a handful of other conservative media outlets. You almost certainly have not heard this from the establishment media. If even one Planned Parenthood center had even one angry guy yelling a little too loudly outside of it, it would be wall-to-wall -wall coverage. You, you'd probably have the FBI involved. 
This would be a, a grave insurrection, threat to democracy, attack on women's health, domestic terrorists. They'd probably be thrown in the solitary confinement cell next to the, the horn hat guy from January 6th or next to the dad who cracked a Coors Light in the Capitol Rotunda. That's the degree of intense terrorism, insurrection we'd be talking about. Meanwhile, 23 pro-life centers, almost two dozen, torched, vandalized, arson, spray paint everywhere. Nothing. Nothing. So just know that. I don't, you, you don't need to go out and shout from the rooftops, think of the hypocrisy. You know, ima- the thing that I actually I just did, which is imagine if the shoe were on the other foot. That's, that's not going to help anything. The reason why it's important for you and I to, to at least acknowledge that is to just remember none of the coverage that we're going to see in the media is fair. None of it is a reflection of reality. When in the we hope, overruling of Roe v. Wade, when you hear about all the hideous, awful, terrible attacks and the threat to, just know it's all fake. It's all BS. The people who are wringing their their hands about this and clutching their pearls, these are people who are are neglecting, who are ignoring, and who are in some cases encouraging attacks on pro-life centers. These are people who kill babies, okay? So there is there is no moral high ground for them here. They are not playing fair and square. This is not a good faith fight. They are, they are launching a very deceptive, dishonest political operation. And when they play the victim, they are, they are trying to distract you from the real victims here, the pro-life centers and the babies, of course. Of course. Speaking of violence, speaking of media cover-ups <laughs> that people are still finding out about, even though the media are trying to cover it up, is a gang member in LA who killed two cops couple of nights ago. A really, really sad story. Had it happen, this was what makes it even sadder. The gang member was able to go kill those two cops because he was out on probation and he was out on probation because of LA's week on crime district attorney, Gascon. Uh, the story came from Bill Malusian, uh, that gang member who shot these two El Monte PD officers was on probation for felony, for felony with a firearm. So it's not, it's not as though he was on probation for a jaywalking. It was felony with a firearm. He received a bare minimum sentence in a play deal un, under George Gascon last year, despite having a previous strike on his record. When we say, oh no, we've got this bad liberal government. Oh no, we've got these bad liberal prosecutors who refuse to prosecute crime. Oh no, we keep losing elections or we, we keep having <laughs> terrible people installed in these positions of power. There are very real world consequences to that. If this dude, George Gascon, had not become the district attorney of Los Angeles, probably those two El Monte police officers would be alive today. Depends. It depends who the other DA would be. But if you had, I mean, George Gascon is so radically on the side of the criminals that it's, it's hard to say that, that anyone else could, could have been anywhere nearly as bad. So if you had not George Gascon in that position, very likely you'd have this thug gangster still rotting in prison. Those two cops would still be alive. Those are very practical consequences. You, you see it throughout the economy. Had the election turned out differently, had the vote counting turned out differently, and Trump had won, we would be in a much better position right now. Probably Putin would not have invaded Ukraine. That's what Zelensky seems to believe because Zelensky in Ukraine thinks that the reason that Putin invaded was because the Trump sanctions were lifted off of the Russian oil pipeline. And that's what gave Putin the green light to invade. Biden himself literally gave Putin the green light to invade. He said, well, as long as it's just a minor incursion, we won't do anything. So he's basically rolling out the red carpet for the guy. If Putin had not invaded Ukraine, do you think energy prices would be anywhere near where they are today? Not, not even close. And by the way, even if there was some kind of pressure for them to go up, Trump was supportive of the Keystone pipeline, which means he was supportive of more pipelines, right? When you shut down Keystone, it's not just one pipeline. You're saying the government won't back any new pipelines. When you support it, you're saying the government back, will back new pipelines. Trump was supportive of oil and gas. He would not have canceled the new oil and gas leases. The, the energy prices would be much lower. You would be saving a lot of money at the pump. Things, th- these what seem like minor moments in history, oh, well, the election went the wrong way, have huge effects for everybody. It's it's enough. We're so riled up these days, you sometimes just want to sit back 
and relax and watch a good movie. You can do that now with Terror on the Prairie. Terror on, on the Prairie is the uncanceling of Gina Carano. The movie is terrific. There's some really great acting and they're really beautiful shots. Head on over to dailywire.com slash Gina to become a member and watch the movie today. That's dailywire.com slash Gina. Also, tomorrow we've got the voice mailbag. You can write in your regular mailbag questions, but you should also send in your voice mailbag questions. Go to my page on the Daily Wire site, click send in a mailbag question, just record it on your phone or your computer, the audio file, send it in, attach it as as an attachment to that email. Keep it under 60 seconds if you don't mind. Sometimes people want to tell me their whole life story and we don't have time for that in this show. So send it in. I look forward to hearing your mellifluous voices. We'll be right back with a lot more. There is a recall effort to take this terrible district attorney in Los Angeles, George Gascon, out of office. Because even though you're not hearing a ton of coverage of these stories, the crime running through the streets in Los Angeles, the two cops who were killed because some thug was let out on bail because of Gascon, you're not hearing a lot about that uh, unless you're listening to this show and others, others on the conservative side. But people still know, even the people who heaven forfend, never tune into the Michael Knowles show. And I feel really bad for those people, by the way. There are people, seriously, there are people in Los Angeles and elsewhere around the country who have not listened to the Michael Knowles show. And frankly, it's too, uh, that, that makes me feel a great deal of pity and sorrow for them. So if you wouldn't mind, please copy the link to the, to the show, email it to all of your friends, send it, maybe even send a postcard with the link right, written on it. It's, I feel bad for these people. You, you know, you get to be here, but these, these poor deprived people. Anyway, I, I digress. There are people who don't listen to this show and the handful of other conservative media outlets who cover this, who still know, they still know, even if all they read is the New York Times and the Washington Post and all those stupid papers, they still know crime is way up. LA is a lot more dangerous right now. There's drug paraphernalia on the streets. Sometimes there are even more disgusting things on the streets. They just know it's gotten bad. And so there is now an effort. The recall DA George Gascon campaign has just announced that it has surpassed 566,857 signatures collected as of June 14th. That reason that number is important, that equates to 10% of LA voters, which means that they can now officially initiate a recall. Now, they actually need more signatures than this because the libs are going to do everything they can to cross signatures off of this list. It's so funny because the libs talk a really good game about how we need every vote to count and every person to participate in our democracy, and you shouldn't have to have an ID to vote, and you sh- anyone should be able to vote, and you should be able to allow your votes to be harvested by a lot of Democrat operatives until it's the Republicans doing it. And then all of a sudden you say, cross him off. Oh, that little old lady wants to recall Gascon. I don't think so. We're going to cross her off the list. And they're going to go through and they're going to take off as many signatures as they can, usually for technicalities. He didn't write his address correctly. That signature looks a little bit off. Oh, actually that address is out of date. And so we're going to cross that out too. They need a buffer and they're they're probably going to get a buffer, I think. Ultimately, the goal is to submit 650,000 to 700,000 total signatures. George Gascon should be quaking in his boots because it just happened up in San Francisco. San Francisco, that town is, what, 150% Democrat at this point, and they had a similarly radical DA, very pro-criminal DA, Chesa Boudin, and that guy not only had a recall initiated against him, he got recalled. Even the Democrats, even up in San Francisco, said, nope, sorry, we're done. We're done. Bye, Boudin. We, we prefer our prosecutors to prosecute people. That's the job. And Gascon is worse than Boudin. He should be quaking in his boots. The Democrats generally should be a little nervous. Assuming that we can figure out election integrity, which I think we broadly can, there are still some challenges on election integrity. The Democrats used COVID as an opportunity to get rid of a lot of the in- election integrity measures in this country. So it, it is much easier for Democrats to steal elections now than it was three years ago. But still, We've tightened some things up around the country. There was a huge win the other night in Texas. This is Texas's 34th congressional district. This is in the Rio Grande Valley. Since 1870, Democrats have held this congressional district. 1870. And then you know what happened? We got a Republican. 
Myra Flores won the special election on Tuesday night. Uh, this will be the first time a Republican's held the seat in what, over 150 years. And by the way, this will be the first person ever born in Mexico who serves in the United States Congress. And she is a Republican. And that is probably going to drive the Democrats crazy because the Democrats say that we're all a bunch of white supremacist, neo-Nazi, we hate the Mexicans. And then they're looking at the polls and they say, wait, why are all the Mexicans starting to vote for the Republicans? <laughs> why, are, why are all the Hispanics broadly moving pretty dramatically into the Republican camp? I mean, depending on what opinion poll you're looking at right now, you are seeing a huge shift where Republicans theoretically could win the Hispanic vote. I wish the numbers were like 80%, 90% for the Republicans, but still the, the Democrats have been banking on this idea that they can just win all the minority votes, the coalition of the ascendant, and the Republican party is just going to be the party of, of old white men, and they're going to die off, thankfully, and we're going to, we're, they've got a demographic cliff that they're falling off of, and the Democrats have been bragging about this for 20 years, and now we're seeing some chinks in that armor. Now we're seeing some, wait a second, huh? Wait, the first Mexican-born member of Congress is a Republican? It's down in a district that the Democrats held for 152 years. Yikes, man. This is probably a pretty scary year for the Democrats. You can't even say, by the way, that it was just some weird, quirky election where the Democrats split the vote or something like that. Flores won. This is a special election to replace an outgoing member of Congress. And so the it's, it's a, it is a weird one in that you had both parties running in the same election. You had multiple candidates, but you had two Republicans and two Democrats. If it were one Republican and two Democrats, you might say, well, the Dems split the vote. But no, it's two Republicans, two Democrats, and this lady won. And now, now she is going to take that seat and she might be a harbinger of things to come. This could be an historic year for the GOP for the, the balance of power in Congress and for Hispanic voters. This might, this could be the year where Hispanic voters start to really seriously shift to the GOP. It has happened to other immigrant groups. This is what happened to the Italians. The Italians come to America and they basically split up their votes. They're a little bit more conservative in some ways. I say this with some firsthand experience of the Italian-American culture, but you've got, you've got people like Scalia, right-wing Republican. You got people like Pelosi, left-wing Democrat. You got people like Michael Cannoli over here. You got people like Andrew Cuomo, who's a left-wing Democrat. You, you can't really tell how a, an Italian-American is going to vote just because his last name ends in a vowel. When it comes to Hispanics, until very recently, you could. And there are a number of reasons for this that have been suggested. Part of it is that while the Italian-Americans were strongly encouraged to assimilate, Sometimes at the back of a paddle, they were encouraged to assimilate. During the most recent waves of Hispanic immigration to America, they really, they've actually been discouraged from assimilating. The numbers have been so massive. The migration has been so massive that there hasn't been a lot of cultural force to assimilate. And so politically, they remain very similar. That might be changing. The way you know the libs are really nervous about this, they're buying up the Spanish stations. I mentioned this a little bit yesterday. So George Soros funding a lot of this. Uh, George Soros has a media consortium that is trying to buy up a lot of Spanish radio stations because the libs are seeing that the, the Hispanic voters are moving to the right. And they say, oh, we can't have this. So we're going to buy up the Spanish stations and then kick off the conservative content, censor the conservatives there, maybe push some left-wing propaganda, and hopefully that'll stop the bleeding. I'm not convinced that it will, but it's a, it's a good strategy. It's a smart strategy. The, the only, I, I'm, I think conservatives should push back against this, obviously, and go in and make sure we've got our own Spanish stations and push our, our own messages to the Hispanic voters. But the very fact that Soros and the crew are doing this, this is good. It means they're genuinely worried about, about the Democrats losing that Hispanic vote. By the way, I do have to address this, because anytime you mention George Soros now, in, in recent years, you're called a wacky, crazy conspiracy theorist who probably hates the Jews and is, uh, you know, believes that there are Martians from planet Zebulon who are, I guess they'd be from planet Mars, controlling the world. And you're, you know, you're a tinfoil hat crazy person. The simple fact is George Soros wields a lot of political influence. Remember the, the 
Democrats used to demagogue about the Koch brothers. And rightly so. The Koch brothers spent a ton of money in Republican politics. So I get why they would focus on the Koch brothers. Well, the same, at least, is true of George Soros. George Soros is a major, maybe the major figure in left-wing financing. I actually had this very strange experience. Back in my wayward youth, I was taking all sorts of odd jobs in New York. I ended up working as a sort of fake sommelier at George Soros's wedding. <laughs> I got hired for this live event thing. They didn't tell me what it was at first. And so I ended up there. It was so funny. This, this is also how I know George Soros doesn't completely control the world, is they clearly hadn't vetted me. They didn't even look up my voter registration. So I end up there and this is George Soros's wedding. I think he had three separate days of weddings. And in this room, you had Nancy Pelosi, you had Samantha Power, you had Kofi Annan, you had Bono, of course, you had uh, uh, people from the IMF, you had people from all over the world who were sitting there, many, many other very influential people from our country and elsewhere, show up to the middle of Westchester County to go to George Soros's wedding. Why? Because he's very, very powerful. And he's got a lot of money and he throws it around in politics. That's not a conspiracy theory. It might be a conspiracy, but it's not a conspiracy theory theory. And they're very, very nervous. Now, speaking of big endorsements, speaking of good momentum for the GOP and Republican politicians, speaking of billionaires throwing their weight around in politics, Elon Musk has just thrown his weight around a little bit. He has suggested that he will be backing Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in 2024. Elon Musk said this morning that he would vote for you if you were to run for president. <laughs> Elon Musk. So what I would say, um, you know, I'm focused on 2022, uh, but with Elon Musk, what I would say is, you know, I welcome support from African Americans. What can I say? Great answer. I assume he had that one in the back of his head. Maybe it was off the cuff. Really, really good answer. He, he did that politician thing where he says, look, I'm not focused on 2024. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I'm focused on 2022. I'm focused on the state of Florida even though I'm involved in national issues every single day. <laughs> and he knows, he knows. He's got an incredible amount of support right now to run for president. He's by far the best governor in America. And so he's proving himself every single day. But he doesn't want to get too out ahead of it here. Don't forget, it's only 2022. So, so what does he do? He makes a little joke about it. And he makes a little politically incorrect joke too. It's not even, it's just a little haha. Oh, you're talking about that African American over there, Elon Musk? Haha. Anyway, yeah, that's cool. I'm glad he supports me. I'm focused on Florida. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. So, why is he doing this? I think this is the smartest strategy that DeSantis could be pursuing right now. Ron DeSantis knows if he is ever going to have a moment, this is his moment. This is it. The way he handled COVID, the way he continues to handle the economy in Florida, the way that people are pouring into Florida from all around the, where are they moving? They're moving to Texas, Tennessee, and Florida. Looking at a very weak incumbent, Joe Biden, his own party doesn't like him, an extremely weak vice president, fewer people like the vice president somehow than like this extremely unpopular president. DeSantis is looking and he's saying, this could be it. This could be DeSantis time, baby. But there's one holdup here, which is Trump. Trump could stop DeSantis from getting the nomination very easily, by the way. And he knows that. Trump was a one-term president who wants his redemption. He is hinted to, more than hinted, he's flat out told people that he is going to run in 2024. And so what can DeSantis do here? He doesn't want to go head to head with Trump, but he could miss his moment. And so what he's doing is he's getting ahead of Trump. He's starting to meet with those donors. He's starting to clearly attract some of those big donors. He's putting himself out there in the news cycle every single day so that if momentum builds for DeSantis right now, it's not building as the anti-Trump momentum. It's just building. It's just, it's just, it's just pro-Ron. It's not anti-Don. So if, if Trump is going to run in 2024, he, he's in a tough spot right now because DeSantis, you're, you see a, a race begin just to scoop up money. There's a limited amount of money for for Republicans, for Democrats too, for anyone who's running for president. There's a limited amount of money out there. And so people have to get those, those commitments early on. They've got to get those endorsements early on. They've got to build that momentum early on. If Trump really does want to run, he's got to get ahead of DeSantis because right now DeSantis is playing his cards so perfectly 
it's, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine how it could be going any better for him. And this is still two years out. But things, things move fast. Things move very fast in politics. Politics is all about timing. Politics is all about timing. Joe Biden used to have a much better sense of timing than he does now. Don't forget, Joe Biden, he ran in 1988. He got laughed out of the race. He didn't run again for 20 years. And then people forgot about 88. He runs again. Then he gets vice president. Then he waits. He thinks 16 is not the year to do it. Okay, 20, now he's going to do it. It's all about timing. And whatever timing Joe Biden previously had, his old age, his senility, it's, it's not working for him anymore. Sometimes people are a little bit past their time. They're a little bit past their prime. They're sort of like Joe Biden, just pretty clearly not the man for the moment. I'm also proud to have signed an executive order on my first day in office to combat discrimination against LGBTQL. I, excuse me, plus Americans. L-G-B-T-Q-P-L-I, huh? What is it? L-M-N-O, huh? Anyway, pride. It's just, it's, this is bad news for him. Uh, th- this, this stumble on a clip is, by, is f- far from being the most egregious gaffe that Biden has made probably even this week. But the reason it matters is it just shows you how out of step he is with his party. He doesn't know. He doesn't know what the trans and the pans and the what a what a bing bam is. He doesn't know any of that. He's not addressing the issues that the Democrats want. He is just a placeholder. He was put in there to be an empty suit. And he used to be very good at channeling the energy of the moment. This is why Joe Biden's positions have changed on every single issue over time is because he doesn't actually believe anything. For his whole career, he's been a weather vane. When he was much younger, he was way better at being a weather vane. Now he's a little rusty. Now when the wind blows, it's not that quick. Whoosh. Whoosh, now I'm in this, now I believe this is about marriage. Now I believe that. Now I, now I think this is about crime. Now I think the opposite about crime. It used to be really, really, now it's just sort of like, you know, the wind is blowing very, very hard from the west, from, from the left side of, of uh, his room. And, he's, and LGBT, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So you got a really weak incumbent. You've got absolutely nobody on the Democrat bench. Who's supposed to replace him? Kamala? No. Buttigieg, no. Stop trying to make Buttigieg happen. It's not going to work. <laughs> no one likes Buttigieg. Who? Elizabeth Warren, her time is totally over. Amy Klobuchar, she's probably got the best shot out of anyone I just named, but that's she doesn't have much of a shot, so that's sort of sad. Hillary, the, maybe they're going to drag Hillary out again so she can lose a, a tenth time. She can, <laughs> they're just, every year, they're just going to bring out Hillary so she can lose again. This is a great opportunity for Republicans. If, if someone is thinking about running for office, very often they'll think, okay, where should I run? What office should I run for? An even more important question, frankly, is when should I run? If it's a big wave year, your chances of winning that lower, that congressional seat, that even that Senate seat, the state Senate seat, for goodness sakes, increases dramatically. So you got to find the timing. Sometimes you got to wait, 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 and then you jump on it. That's what's happening right now in Alaska. Race is not getting a lot of play, but Alaska has one congressional district and has one politician who is more famous than any other up there. That would be, of course, Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin is running for Congress, and Sarah Palin is absolutely crushing it. She won in the first round of voting for Alaska's congressional seat special election. 54.4% of the vote, when that, by the time that had come in, Palin had 32,000 votes to just over 20,000 for the second place finisher. Uh, she's, she's doing right. She's absolutely crushing it. The field included 48 different candidates to replace Representative Don Young, who died in March. And so now the top candidates will go on. They'll go to the next round of the state's first ever ranked choice nonpartisan primary. So the, the parties don't really matter. It's going to be ranked choice. It's going to be kind of weird. It's weird in a different way, but still weird, sort of like that, that race down in Texas where the prominent Republican woman, lots of momentum, lots of energy, where she won as well. I was trying to think about what I feel about Sarah Palin. I don't know Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin was 
the vice presidential candidate. Just around the time that I started to really become involved in politics, even frankly a little bit before I was really involved working on campaigns, that sort of thing. What do I think about Sarah? I don't know that much about Sarah Palin. Do you follow Alaska politics very closely? Probably not. And yet, just deep in my gut, I like Sarah Palin. I was trying to figure out why do I like Sarah Palin? I don't really know that much about her career. I don't, haven't followed her very much since she left the presidential, vice presidential campaign trail. I know she's done some weird TV shows and things. I haven't paid attention to that. So why do I like her? I like Sarah Palin because they hate Sarah Palin. <laughs> That's why. That's what it comes down to. I don't know. Maybe Sarah Palin has some problems, but my gut tells me I am inclined to like this woman because all the right people hate her. And that's usually a pretty good rule of thumb in politics. Right now, an, another prominent Republican woman, Lauren Boebert, is coming under fire, for, I think, completely ridiculous, spurious attacks, trying to oust her, you know, end of the campaign surprise kinds of, of nonsense. I think, why do I like Lauren Boebert? I actually am friends with Lauren Boebert. I, so I, I, you know, I've gotten to spend some time with her personally. I like her from, you know, what we've what we've, uh, how we've interacted and the things that I followed her do in Congress. But even if I didn't, even if I had never met Lauren Boebert, I didn't know anything about her record, I would still be inclined to like Lauren Boebert. Why? Because all the right people hate her. That's a good guide. That is a good guide to things. Because the people who hate Sarah Palin and who hate Lauren Boebert and who hate Donald Trump and who hate Ted Cruz and who hate Ron DeSantis and who hate all these guys, those people are wrong about pretty much everything. Do you think that Dr. Fauci likes Sarah Palin? Uh, probably not. Do you think Joe Biden, well, we know Joe Biden. Do you think any of these people? And, and politics is, in many ways, a team sport. It has to be. That's why we have parties. That's why we have elections. Because you can't, it, sh it shouldn't just be a team sport. It, has to, it also has to have something to do with reason and justice and the truth and a role for individuality breaking out of some stale old talking points. For goodness sakes, Trump certainly did that in 2016. But you need to come together as a team. And there, there's a reason. There's a reason why people who are pro-life also support economic growth. There's a reason why people who support American traditions and the traditional American family, also support secure borders. I know it seems like those are different issues, but they're not. They have a coherence. They, 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 they say something about what we believe about philosophy and theology and the relation of man to the state. There's, there's a kind of coherence to that. Okay? You actually can judge a man by his enemies. And right now, this is a story we can't get to. I'll have to get to it tomorrow. GW, George Washington University, has just voted to get rid of its mascot, who's a guy who looks like George Washington called the Colonial. The Colon and they, they're voting to get rid of that because they hate Washington. They hate the Colonials. They hate Ameri the America's founding. The people who hate Lauren Boebert and Sarah Palin and Donald Trump and all these people, they also hate George Washington. They want to tear down his statues. And Christopher Columbus. And all, they, they are just... They've got a bad view of the world. And so, especially in an election year, I am very inclined to look at where my, where my enemies and my opponents are moving, the people they're afraid of, the people they're pushing back hardest against. Those are the people that I'm going to defend. Those are the people that I'm going to stand on the side with and hopefully win. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vidovsky. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Associate producer, Justine Turley. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. And hair and makeup by Cherokee Hart. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. Today on the Ben Shapiro Show, the Federal Reserve boosts interest rates by 75 basis points for the first time since 1994, even as retail sales unexpectedly decline. Plus, Joe Biden hosts an LGBTQ plus minus divided by sign celebration at the White House while announcing government action to trans the kids. That's today on the Ben Shapiro Show. Give it a listen. Listener.